Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Welcome. I have a very special guest that I have the privilege of interviewing today. Her name is Stephanie McLarty. Did I say that right? Now you all did. of a sudden I'm like, <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. I'm like, wait a minute. I was practicing it before we got on the air and now did I say it right? McLarty. I love that name so much. I want to say it McLarty. So Stephanie is an award-winning entrepreneur and champion of sustainable business. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about her before I start quizzing her on everything that she has going on. So because you guys are going to be so impressed with this woman. In 2010, she founded Reficient. Did I say that? Name you that did. Business correctly? Reficient. It's R-E, like R and then efficient. I love that. It's really cool. It's a marketplace for telecom companies to reuse and recycle their old equipment. And as someone who worked at a telecom company, I can tell you there is a lot of old equipment. <laughs> and her company grew to 1 million in sales by year three and continues to divert over 150,000 items from landfill every year. Thank you so much for doing that. And then something wonderful happened. Her daughter arrived in 2017 and Stephanie was especially grateful that entrepreneurship gave her time and flexibility for what mattered most. So she launched Wealth of Family to teach other moms how to start a business they love and that aligns with their life. And that is, you are a woman after my own heart, Stephanie. Thank you so much for doing that. So tell us a little bit about your journey, Stephanie. How did you get that first business started? Well, it was not something I planned to do. It was something unexpected, as they often are. But I had done an exchange to Europe when I was 16, and that changed my life. And so when I finished university, I decided I wanted to travel and see the world. So I gave myself two years to go abroad and I went to Thailand for six months with Right to Play, which is an organization that helps kids in disadvantaged situations to do play and sport. And then I ended up in India for a year. That was not planned either. Um, and I ended up teaching English there. I fell in love, it was a disaster. And then I came home and I decided to do a master's degree. And by that point I had so much international experience. So I thought I would do something in that realm. So I did a master's in peace and conflict transformation in Europe. And because I had traveled so much prior to this, I was essentially broke. So I decided I would do <laughs> one semester of my master's and then I would come home and work and then go back and finish. And that's what I did. And the job that I got in between my semesters was at a major telecom company. And I was hired on as an asset recovery technician. So I had no idea what asset recovery even meant, but essentially for about eight months, I wore steel toed boots and I drove around oh. a red company van and I went out to the old network sites and physically pulled out the old equipment and figured out what to do with it. So could it be reused within the company? Could it be resold to someone else for reuse? Should it be recycled? If so, where does it go? And keep in mind, I knew nothing about this going into it. But by the end of those eight months, I had this niche knowledge of telecom infrastructure and what to do with it. So I did go back and finish my master's, but I started consulting in this space on the side. And then I launched Reficient in 2010. And I'd seen that there was all this equipment coming out of certain companies. There were other companies that wanted it, but how do you make the matches of who has what, yeah. who needs what? So I decided 
not that I knew anything about this, that we needed a <laughs> technology-based solution. So we literally built a software platform to help us to do this. And then the company grew from there. And um, that's how I got started. Stephanie, that is so exciting. Did you have a technology background? Did you know a lot about technology? No, I, I, I don't. And frankly, still to this day, I would not say that's my key strength. But I was good at you know, seizing opportunity, taking initiative. And because I'm a really big reuse recycler, I'm really passionate about sustainability. That's what drove me to start this business because it drove me nuts mm -hmm. when I saw the wrong thing happening with the equipment. Mm -hmm. And we think about our computers and our cell phones and all of those personal electronics, but there's all of this technology that sits behind the scenes that also goes through upgrading, but what happens to it? Yes. So that's where I ended up focusing and to this day have continued to find that niche um, in that mm -hmm. space. Wow. I love your story on so many levels. And by the way, if I sound different now, you know, when you and I were first trying to figure out how we sounded, I actually forgot to put my mic in front of me. <laughs> minor detail <laughs> it's always something so yeah in, in case you're like wow you sound different all of a sudden i remembered to put my mic in front of me um so what i am fascinated by on so many levels with this one is something that you said which is while you were doing that job you really identified that unique niche that unique need and, you know, a lot of times people think that they're just in their own head, in their own house, and something inspirational comes to them. And I find that most of the time, it's something like what you're talking about. It's you're doing something else to earn a living, perhaps, or doing something to help someone else, or doing something for whatever reason other than, uh, this is my great, brilliant idea I have. And then your passion of sustainability meshed with this knowledge that you gained. And when those two things came together, that's when you had the big light bulb moment, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about, you know, like, do you, and can you talk about your other business? Because I feel like that is where you help women have that light bulb moment of their own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when I was starting Reficient, you're right. It, it married my passion for sustainability. And then I had all of this unique niche knowledge around telecom infrastructure. And there was this business need to match these things two together so I could actually make money at it. And it's, that's essentially what I teach to moms who do my course. So, so backing up a bit, I've done this business now for 10 years, but when I became a mom, everything changed. And I had this beautiful little redhead girl. Her name's Clara. I love her. And I was so thankful that I got to control my time. I got to say like, where I spent my time. And I got to bring my daughter with me to work if I needed to. And I loved it. It was an integrated approach to being a mom and having a business. And so many of my other friends struggled with, they were on mat leave and then they had to go back at some point to a job that they dreaded. Like literally it was dread that they experienced. So they would ask me for feedback and you know ideas for business. And so I, I mentored many of my friends to start businesses. And that's when I realized, you know, there's a lot of women out there that could use this help and really, they all have different passions and they have different strengths. And so how do you put that into a business? So I really do encourage these women to look at what are the things that they love to do? So the things that doesn't feel like work, they just naturally do anyways. What are they super good at? What are their strengths? And if they don't know, I encourage them to go talk to other people and hear what they have to say. Because sometimes we can't 
we don't know for ourselves. We can't see what our strengths are, but other people can easily point them out. It's fascinating. And I'm sure that there's a whole psychology to that. And then to explore the, the economic opportunities that marry those two things. So, because ultimately you have to make money at it to make it sustainable in the long term. Otherwise, it'd be a great long term volunteer job. And at some point, probably for most people, it'll be like, why am I doing this? But it's right. those light bulb moments of, wow, like I'm good at this. I'm really passionate about this. And there's this gap. I wish this product existed, or I wish the service existed, or I wish somebody else solved this for me. Mm -hmm. And that's usually where the light bulb comes up of, oh, I see another path forward for myself. Yeah. It's really cool. I love that. That is way cool. I agree. And um, it, that's exactly how I started my training and coaching business because I was trying to find virtual assistants to work for me because my business had grown so big. Um, as a I was a virtual assistant, I needed to hire subcontractors to run, you know, to complete all the tasks that I had coming in. I couldn't find people could, who were as good as I wanted them to be at what they did. And so I started training people, much like you, when you started training people that asked you, I started training them. And I actually, like you, I did it for free for a little bit. And I'm like, what am I doing? I need to charge for this. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Like there's value yeah. there, right? There is huge value. Yeah. 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 So in, in our business and my one business refitient, we continue to use what we call contractors. So we have our mm -hmm. core group of staff and then we bring in outside people for the roles that are either not a full-time role or they change or there's something about them that um, is, is niche and, and we just don't need them for that full time. So like our mm -hmm. bookkeeper and um, social media marketing and that kind of thing. So that's a great model too, to mm -hmm. fill in for those gaps for people. So your contractors are the bookkeepers and the social media people, those are your contractors? Um, and also on the warehouse side, because we have a physical aspect to our business, which is the receiving and the testing of equipment. We have staff. And then when we have projects where, you know, we have to test 5,000 modems in a week, we'll bring in outside Ooh. people to, to help us. That has actually changed a bit with the pandemic because we're trying to limit who physically comes in. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's a great model to use when, when we need that extra help. Yeah. So tell, talk a little bit more about the specifics, if you don't mind, of like how many or what percentage or whatever numbers you want to share, um, contractors versus employees do you have at Reficient versus Wealth of Family and anything else that you want to share about that? Yeah, so at Reficient, we have, we're a core team of five. We're a small company. And then from um, a contractor standpoint, we have um, three extra contractors that we use from time. Well, some of them are ongoing, and then actually two of them are ongoing, and one is from time to time. So we're small, but it's also finding that I found this really nice place of a business where... I don't work that much. I like the business is under control. We can like expand as we need to. Um, it's a comfortable place to be. So yeah. So you're running a multi-million dollar business with five, a staff of five. Yeah. If yeah. any of you guys are listening to this and you didn't realize that was possible, you're hearing it right now from Stephanie. And I will tell you, I hear this over and over and over again. In this day and age, you do not have to have a big staff no. to have a lot of revenue. No. And I also want to just point out that, I mean, I'm 10 years into this business. With any business, there's that period where you start it up, where you have to put more time and effort into, you know, to get it off the ground. And then you usually hit that tipping point where, you grow more quickly. Um, so now I, because of the pandemic and because of the way I've set up my business and built it to a certain level, I work um, 12 to 15 hours a week. 
That's it. On both businesses or just one of them? Well, on my Reficient business, um, and not much more on my other one, just because I don't have the time because I have a toddler and the normal childcare options are not available. So I've had to yeah. make do and I realized, wow, I actually, I don't actually work that much either. It's not something to, for everyone to expect right away, but you can build your business such that you can create the lifestyle that you want. You can work as much or as little as you want. And I found this really um, nice place for myself and, and it's possible. Congratulations. Yeah. And you know, that's why they call these a lifestyle business um, because you can choose the lifestyle you want. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people fail to realize that part because they keep staying busy just because they think that's what success looks like. Mm -hmm. And I congratulate you on not needing that number one and number two on setting your business up in a way that you can do that. So what tips do you have on how to set your business up when you're putting that initial time in and getting it all set up? What tips do you have on how to set it up so that you can work 12 to 14 hours a week and still run the big, you know, five staff, but a multi-million dollar revenue business? So I think the key things are figuring out what your core activities are, what the key things are that you need to do and to focus on that will get your business to the next level. Usually it's like three things that you really need to focus on. And at least one of them is sales and marketing, but it's, there's not that many things you have to do. You can get distracted by so many, but figure out what the core activities will be that will move you forward. And then also think about like what we were talking before, what it is that you're good at, what you enjoy doing, and as much as possible, start outsourcing, letting other people do those things that you don't love to do or that are a real drag for you to do. Um, one of my things is I'm, I'm not so much a detail-oriented person. So if I get into the weeds, literally my energy drops. And that's a sign right there that that's not something that I should be doing, at least not long term. So mm -hmm. when you can start outsourcing, so, you know, virtual assistant, that's a perfect fit. And you might also find that you're really good at getting in the weeds. You love those details. <laughs> well, then you should be doing that for someone else, right? Going back to <laughs> what are your strengths and focusing mm -hmm. on your strengths and focusing on those key things that will move your business forward. That's the, the best place to start. Yeah, a, actually, that's was, such great advice. Go ahead. And I was just going to say too, that for moms or women in general that are starting out and really at any level of business, there's a tool called a business model canvas. It's a one page document that you can fill out and it gets you to really hone in on what are those key things that you need to do what are the key ways you're going to make money the key ways that you're going to promote yourself or collaborate with others and it gets you to really focus on that and i think that's a great tool in place of a business plan even if you're asked by someone to do a business plan like if you're going to a bank or something then by all means do it but if not just focus on this business model canvas, this one page tool. And that way, as things change in your business, then you can update it easily. And it's a visual reminder of this is what I need to focus on. Yeah. Stephanie, that is such great advice. And I'll tell you, I am in total agreement with you. There are so many people that have come to me and said, I really want to start a business, but I know I have to have a business plan in place first. And I'm like, why do you think you have to have a business plan in place? <sighs> Well, because that's what everybody does. And I said, you don't have to do what everybody does because that's old school. That is not what you need. In fact, if you spend the time to really put in place a business plan, number one, you're not going to know the answer to half the stuff that you have to fill in on that business plan because you haven't done it yet. And if you spend all your time trying to figure out what to fill in on that, you could have gotten your business started and begun earning money. So which do you want to do? And yeah. I love that one page business model 
canvas. That is that's a right. great idea because that's really what is needed. And then if down, this is what I tell people, if down the road you're like, you know, everybody has a business plan. I'm feeling like I'm missing out on a business plan. All, by all means, create it. By then you'll know all the answers to fill in on the mm -hmm. business plan. But by then you'll probably be like, why did I ever think I needed a business plan? For sure. And you know, yeah. a year down the road, your, your business might look a little different than when you first started. And maybe a year later than that, as you, you know, pivot, especially in, in this day and age with the pandemic oh, yeah. and things changing, it's great to write it down, but just be open that things can change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're, um, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that because I very much have strong feelings about that as you can, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> and I, the reality is too, I think a lot of people think, well, I'm going to go to the bank, I'm going to borrow money and need a business plan. The reality is that most banks won't even loan to startup businesses and you have to show your results in order to get a loan. You have to show how you're making money. So you're not doing it for them because that's probably a result you're not going to get right away. So mm -hmm. focus on these, you know, simpler, smaller steps first. So many things in life can be simplified. So do yourself yeah. a favor and simplify it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing that. So in your wealth of family where you teach moms how to launch their own businesses, um, you shared with me that something amazing happened after you started that. And would you share that with our listeners? I would. So I, I've already mentioned that I am a big proponent of sustainability um, and it's how I live my life. And in the course, one of the things I encourage the women to do is also follow their values. Like what is important to them, right? Because if you're doing something that, and you're putting a lot of time and effort into it to get it off the ground, if it's not something meaningful to you, if the going gets tough, it'll be easy to give up. So, so find something that, that you love and that is really based on your values. And a really cool thing happened, and I, I didn't plan for it, but I started to see that out of the businesses coming out of that course, they were inherently environmentally friendly. They were inherently community-based, um, for example. So one of the moms is creating a sustainable redesign ser um, service. So basically, if you have a room or a problem in your house and you don't know how to deal with it, but you also don't necessarily want to renovate it either, or maybe you don't have the budget or whatever, she can help you see your problem in a whole new way and use materials you already have, things you already have, um, recycled materials and help you embrace this in a whole new way. So it's really, it's this concept of reuse applied to interior decorating, really. It's really cool. And uh, another mom is doing um, DIY recipes not for food, but for skincare and cleaning products and that kind of thing. Um, another mom is working on building a toy library. So where you can Ooh. borrow toys and then bring them back. And it's focused on like better quality, sustainable materials, like with wood and all that kind of toys. And as we know, kids have a fairly short attention span, right? They go through toys at different stages. Why own all this stuff when you can borrow them and then take them back and get new toys and stuff? Um, so, I love that idea. I love that idea so much. I'm just like, where do I borrow it? Because I would love to, I know, <laughs> even right? as an adult, I love toys. And the other thing I love is games. But I like to try a game and see if I really like it. So I'd love to borrow a game to see if it's something I really want to play long term or if it's just something I want to use for a little while. So yeah. I don't know if she's got games in there too, but if she doesn't suggest that and then send me the link because I want to, <laughs> I want to do it. Be, I want to rent, be a long I want to rent toys and games. <laughs> it'll be a long way to borrow it from Canada. but <laughs> Oh, darn it. Yeah. Not after I moved to Canada. It okay, won't. Well, <laughs> <very true. laughs> 
don't tell my and husband. <laughs> there's another really cool thing that happened over the course too, and that was embracing family. So um, one of the moms, uh, her husband is a cartoonist. And so she ended up taking his cartoon images and making it into prints and artwork that you can hang in kids' rooms. And so she created an Etsy store online, but she also took her son with her and went to local shops and sold a whole bunch of prints into local shops. And I thought that's so cool to bring your kids, right? And get them involved Mm -hmm. in that whole process to teach them entrepreneurship at a young age. Right. So that is really cool. It's the whole, it's the power of women. And I say moms sometimes because moms having children have a real vested interest in the future, right? They want their future for their kids to look a certain way, but really it's the power of women to change the world. Like, I don't know. That's just so inspiring. And I just love that that just naturally happened over this course. Oh my gosh, that Stephanie, that has to be so fulfilling for you. It is. It is. It's certainly, it's like why, why I'm doing this and why I'm spending the time on it. Um, and the ripple effect, right? Because all yes. the stats that show that when, when women ha- like they make, when they're the ones earning money, they invested in their community, you know, they invested in their families. Like there, there's that, that ripple effect outward. And so oh, it's so cool on many levels. It is. And I truly believe, just like you, that the power of women can change the world for the better. We can spread more love. We are the supportive, the lovers. Um, you know, this world has been created primarily by men. Now, I'm not a man basher. You know, I have a husband. I love my husband. I have two sons and I have five grandkids that are all boys. So believe me, I am not a man basher. But if you are not happy with the way the world is going right now, um, and you're a woman, I really want you to think about stepping up. You know, stepping up like Stephanie is talking about, whether it's, you know, whatever it is that you're passionate about, passionate about, that can help somebody else in the world. That can help your family. You can leave a legacy. You can shape your own destiny. You really can. And when you do that, that ripple effect, Stephanie, that you're talking about just keeps going on and on and on. And we as women can change this world for the better. I truly believe it. And I can tell you do too. I totally do. And we're at a time in history when we need to change the world, where we need transformative solutions for the future of our kids and of planet earth. And yes, and I'm not a man basher either. And I love my (laughs) husband and all all the men. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily about women. It's the qualities, right? The qualities of that's right of caring more about the long term and the community effect, the love, that kind of thing. That's what's mm-hmm. important. And yeah. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to what you were talking about with your values. So do you, you know, I think there are a lot of people who really don't think, and I, I was one of them back in the corporate world. I never thought about my own values. You know, there were mission statements for the corporation that I was in. I knew what, their values were, I knew what they want expected of me, but I hadn't actually thought about my own beliefs and what I valued for myself and my family. So do you have any, because if there was me, I know there's more people like me. So any tips on how you can begin to identify what your values are? I think the place to start is to ask yourself, what do you care about? Like, what are the things, the people that are most important to you? And and really just sit with it for a few days and be present. Because I think once you start this inquisitive journey of looking into your values and, and trying to understand what's important to you, you'll see things pop out of the woodwork. That's just how things go. You'll start noticing things anew. So figure out what it is that's most meaningful to you that you really 
couldn't live without or do without. That's a place to start. And then start exploring who else is on that same wavelength? Um, what are the, you know, the organizations or the other businesses that are on that same wavelength? My business Reficient is a certified B corporation. So certified B Corp is a global certification that you can get. The B stands for benefit. And it's kind of like the concept of fair trade, but applied to business in general. So yes, you are a for-profit business as a cert certified B Corp, but you voluntarily commit to higher levels of transparency, accountability, and performance. So I love that. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Yeah. Thank you for opening my eyes to this. No problem. So it's really interesting. And what I realized, speaking of values, is I created Reficient based on my values. You know, it's it's weaved into the fabric of the company, how we market, how we communicate. Um, and that there's a whole movement across the world that believes in all the same things. And it's called Certified B Corp. And so basically you commit to not only doing what's best for your shareholders, but also that of the community, the environment, and your employees. So that it's not just about profit, it's about being a good company being a good citizen of the world and to become this you have to take this questionnaire i think it's like 200 questions just to show your um your performance what you care about mm -hmm. but also you have to change your articles of incorporation so if you're incorporated to say this that you will not just take the interests of your shareholder into account but also the interests of the community, the environment, and your employees, so that you're legally wow. binding, right? <gasps> so that's amazing. You're really committing. I love that. You are. It's not just lip service. It's not just what do they call that greenwashing or something like that. Yes, correct. It's not yeah. just greenwashing. And then there's this whole global movement of redefining what success is in business. So you're a part of that, and it's really it's. A privilege really to be a part of it and to be a part of something bigger and redefining that success so it's not just mm -hmm. about our bottom line because we know the long-term impact of what just being about a bottom line can do like we're facing that in right. our world right now that's right so yeah well stephanie could you share that link with me and i'll include that in the show notes the link to learn more about the certification as a b corporation absolutely i will yeah Thank and I just you. want to point out too, um, because I'm sure many listeners are in the U.S., that in certain states you could actually choose to incorporate as a benefit corporation. It's one of your options. We don't I have that option in Canada, that. but in certain states, it's not like across the board, you have that option now. So you can, wow, yeah. you can bake it can in. Can you right tell I've beginning. never even? <laughs> can you tell I've never even heard of this? Literally, I've never heard of this. So thank you so much no problem. for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things um, that I wanted to ask you about, since you have two companies that are really quite different from each other, and you have both contractors and employees, uh, depending on your needs. And now with the pandemic, you have people who used to work in the office that are now working virtual. So could you talk a little bit about how you've been juggling all of that, how, you, how to manage all of that? You're obviously doing a great job if you only have to work 12 to 14 hours a week. You obviously have really good employees and contractors who run your business. So any tips that you can share with those of us who are not quite as good at that as you are? Well, I would say it, I've come to a great place. I've learned some things the hard way. Um, first of all, it's finding great people. I would say every single one of our employees treats the business as if it were their own. So mm -hmm. as you're looking to add to your team in whatever regard, that's one of the lenses by which to think about people. Like, will they treat this 
like it's their own. And ultimately that's what you want. It's people that you can trust that will deliver, that will do the right thing when no one is watching. Right. Yes. And they will contain your costs and, and all of that as well. So that would be my, my first tip. And we've been moving towards a virtual setup. I, I'm really proud that three years ago or so, we started this movement to becoming virtual. We used to have, for example, offices for everyone. We had desks, desk phones, and we realized that we're just using our cell phones. And why, why do we spend this money and have this hardware sitting here? So we started mm -hmm. to um, move away from the physicality of the business and really look at what's the functional nature of the role. Um, so our warehouse employees, for example, there's no way that we can get around them really working from home apart from certain tasks. So mm -hmm. they physically come in, but everyone else is, and, and even them in some extent, everyone's equipped with a laptop and a cell phone. And in order to stay connected, we do a daily huddle. We do this mm -hmm. daily huddle at 9, 12 a.m. Not 9, 10. Okay. What's the uniqueness 9, of 9, 12? <laughs> Why so specific? There's got to be a reason. <laughs> there is a reason. And that's because it forces punctuality. So think about it. If someone tells you to show up at 9 o'clock, like, yeah, mm -hmm. sure, you'll show up sometime around there. Show up at 9, 12. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know that, you know, that is serious, right? Right. So it forces punctuality and the nature of our daily huddle is really to spend maximum 10 minutes and going over our key activities that we need to do, like the main priorities for the day. And that's it. And so by forcing that punctuality at 9, 10, it, it sets a tone of what's our main priorities. Is there anything that that we need to discuss, like sometimes there's something that two of them need to discuss, they'll do it offline, or ideally they do it offline. Mm -hmm. um, so that really, it helps us to stay connected with each other, even though we're in different places. And then we do a mm -hmm. weekly meeting as well, where we come on on video. So we're only once a week getting on video, but I find, especially now, that video is important. It's not something we need to do all the time, but you need to leverage technology. Um, we use a lot of chatting through Microsoft Teams. So that's another thing to think about is what technologies are out there to help you. And the good thing is there's new technologies coming out all the time. So mm -hmm. what was available last year at this time might be different than now. There might be more out there. So the, those are some right. of the Or things. whatever was out there might have improved. Exactly. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. So... Oh, those are such great tips. I love the huddle at 912. I love that. And it's 10 minutes long? It's, Just 10 minutes every yeah. day. It's supposed and to be most five of you on there? Yeah. Is it the five, five or six? Five yeah. of you? Yeah. Okay. So And does everybody talk? Mm -hmm. I'm so fascinated by this. <laughs> I can waste 10 minutes talking and say nothing. <laughs> We usually have about one minute while people are arriving. There's about one minute of, you know, the small talk and then it's right mm -hmm. to business. And, mm -hmm. and we'll call each other out on it too. Like, Oh, you're getting into the weeds. Like bring it back. Um, so that's another thing is creating the space. So everybody is accountable call each and other out. call each other out. I love that. That I love concept that. I learned in a book which was a fantastic book and it's still one of my best um, recommendations for business books. And that is mastering the Rockefeller habits. So it's all about what made John D Rockefeller so successful. And yes, he, mm -hmm. he was around what hundred years ago, but it's the, the principles are timeless and it's not a new book. Mm. Yeah. I remember seeing that book. I'm going to have, to, I've not read it though. I'm going to have to go back and check that out because that is a great suggestion. And my mm -hmm. team and I meet once a week for 30 minutes and we've just started doing this and it's just my C-level team. So there are, there are five of us, four, there are four of us and we haven't made it to just 30 minutes yet, but I am going to implement this idea of 
calling each other out because I believe I'm the biggest um, problem in the, in the group. And if I tell them to call me out, oh, they're going to love that. Okay, <laughs> perfect. And I think you oh, also, they are, they're going to love it. <laughs> you need to set the expectation as well. Like we're going to talk about whatever five main things or whatever that is for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the okay. expectations are clear. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, I set the expectation and we're going to get this done in 30 minutes. And then we look at the time and we're like, oh my gosh, we're already three minutes past. And we have this one more thing we have to talk about. So I love it. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to get that book, the Rockefeller book. Thank you so much for that tip. Um, and you seem like a really kind person, Stephanie. And I mean that in a really good way, because when I think about the kind of business that you've built, I mean, telecom is very heavily a man, a male industry, and you have really jumped in there and you have done this and you have done this with very small staff and you've built a huge business, but yet I can tell that you're kind and you're not like running roughshod over people like so much, so many times happens in the business world. So how do you stay there? How do you stay kind and generous? And what other, what are your values? Kindness um, is one of them for sure. I mean, it's, I asked myself. It is. I really picked up on it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to be honest, one of the things I was doing just before recording this podcast was writing um, handwritten notes to the customers that I would have gone to physically visit this year. And instead we're including gift cards for them to take their staff out for coffee or go get coffee in or whatever. Um, and just saying like, we're sorry, we can't meet you this year. So yeah. is it Tim Horton? Is it Tim yeah, Hortons? Yeah, most of them are, are Tim Hortons. <laughs> that's the national coffee chain, right? Like that, we can be sure that there's a Tim Hortons <laughs> close to them. Very good. <laughs> My understanding is it's now some in some places in the U.S. a lot too. Yeah, I believe me. When we lived in Canada, we were like so fascinated by this Tim Hortons thing, and then when we came back to the U.S., we were like, oh, "They're starting to open here! It's so exciting, Tim's." It's not, it's not like it's the greatest coffee around, but you know, it's our little. They have a lot of adventure. donuts. That's what yes. really excited my husband was how many donuts they had. Yes. He's a big donut fan. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes, they do, and. <laughs> So, so, you know, it's the things It goes back to what's important to me and what kind of business would I be proud to run? And yeah, in my space in telecom, it is very male dominated. I can't think of another female business owner. Um, well, that's not true. There are some in the U S but in terms of like my peers that I talk with on a regular basis, it's, it's not, but I've come to realize that's also my advantage. Right. I don't have to operate like others. I can do what's authentic to me. And hence why we send handwritten cards. And at Christmas time, uh, we, we usually send postcards that are made with seed paper. So you can plant the cards after they're done with them, oh, grow flowers that. or herbs, you know, things like that, because I just think that's cool and it's different it and it cool. resonates with people. So use and it's the so on brand for you. Yeah. So use yeah. the things that are important to you and leverage them because chances are they're what makes you unique anyway. And yes. a little lesson I learned is, you know, when you're growing up and you just want to fit in and like, you just want to be like everybody else. Ironically, it's the things that make you stand apart, the things that are different about you that will be your true gems in life that can really, you know, it's whether it's your creativity or like your look or whatever, those are the things that can mm -hmm. really help you to thrive in life. It's ironic. Mm -hmm. It is. Yes. I absolutely agree with you. So when you are helping women uh, to launch their own businesses, have you ever run into, and this is something I run into a lot, which is why I named the podcast Dare to Leap. Do you ever run into women who are afraid to take that leap? Well, that is a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, there, I think on some level and at some point we all struggle with that, that dare of leaping. 
of getting outside of our comfort zone and being afraid. And every so often it rears up for me. And there's two things that I've learned throughout my life and throughout my business journey. One is, and there's a really powerful image, and I'll send you the link to this if you don't already have it. Oh, good. It. Yes, please. There, you have your comfort zone, and then you have where the magic happens. The magic happens outside of your comfort zone. So whatever it is that you want to do in life, it will require you to get out of your comfort zone. It will require you to face the fears and be brave and to leap and get out of your comfort zone. So whenever I feel nervous about something, to me, it's actually an indicator that I'm getting outside of my comfort zone and it's a good thing. And so I can be afraid, I can be nervous and take action. Because I think we think, oh, I'm nervous, I'm afraid. I can't take action, but you can be nervous and take action. You can be afraid. That's called courage. And take action. Yeah. That's called courage. Yeah. 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 So that's one thing. And the other thing that I've learned in my life is that I was afraid of failing at at something because I confused failing and being a failure. So I thought if Mm -hmm. I failed at something, I was a failure. Mm -hmm. But really, to fail at something or to not have it work out or whatever it is that you call it, that's just a verb. It's to fail. Being a Mm -hmm. failure is taking on all the personal crap of, you know, whatever that (laughs) like convoluted feelings are that hold you back. And you don't need to take that on. You can fail at something and not be a failure. You can have something not work out and not be a failure. You don't have to take that on. Don't, take it personally. And so as soon as I saw that failing at something is really just a verb, just like it is to win at something, then it's like, oh, okay, well, I can, I can go for it. That doesn't hold me back anymore. Yeah. I love that. That is a great way to look at that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Stephanie, I could talk to you all day long. So if fun. someone's listening to this and they're like, wow, I want to know more about what Stephanie has to offer. I want to get to know her better. I want to become part of her community, whatever that is. Can you tell people the best way to get in touch with you to learn more about you? Yeah, the best way to get in touch with me is to go to wealthoffamily.com. So it's wealthoffamily.com and you can connect with me there. And um, there's also a whole bunch of free resources on there for figuring out a business to start, like finding your passion. Um, It's a whole resource library. So they they can participate in that as well. Fabulous. I will put a link to that in the show notes because uh, resources are always a good thing. I'm guessing somewhere you might also have some inspirational quotes hanging out. Do you? Some inspirational quotes. Facebook or anywhere in your, re- um, in, you know, on wealth of family or anywhere. You just seem like the kind of person that would have inspirational quotes. I think there's an inspirational <laughs> quote that I said on my homepage. <laughs> okay, cool. But I don't cool. have a coalition, no. <laughs> but, <laughs> I just thought maybe like Facebook business page or LinkedIn or something like that. Uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> okay, so there's something new for you because yeah. I just see, do you like inspirational quotes? I do, I do, yeah. 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 I, I really right. see you as There's that person. There's some on our Pinterest. That, that likes inspirational. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Pinterest. Pinterest. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, you, and here's why. You are inspiring me. I know you are inspiring the listeners. And I would love to have, I'm very serious here. I would love to have some quotes from you. Um, some of your words of wisdom that you just shared here uh, made into memes so if you don't do it i'm gonna do it and i will i will let you know i will tag you in the quotes that i have made i do this all the time i do when somebody inspires me i'm like well i'm gonna listen to this i'm gonna take these little quotes that they've said and then i have my uh, social media graphic artist person create them into memes for me oh my god that's so great and and i (laughs) because i don't want to forget 
So you can tell I'm really into inspirational quotes. Love it. <laughs> I yeah. So I'll do that and I'll tag you and then you can start using them wherever you want. Okay. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to worry about it. See, this is, you guys, this is how she works 12 to 14 hours a week is she doesn't take on somebody else's burden. Like I was just trying to put that monkey on her back and she's like, yeah, no, no. <laughs> um. <laughs> but this is the power of, of virtual assistance, right? Getting people to do That's right. the things. Exactly. That Cause all I have to you do, do is this tell my graphic guy. Yeah. yeah. Graphic I can tell my graphic person. guy, Hey, listen to that one. Uh, grab those uh, inspirational quotes out of there. Make memes. I look forward to seeing them. Awesome. Then, that's all I have to do. Done. <laughs> Sweet. That's yeah. the way it should be. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Stephanie, I just have enjoyed this time together so much. I feel like I have gotten so much out of this and I know everybody listening to this has. So I look forward to um, stalking you online myself. <laughs> and I mean that literally. <laughs> I will be following you. Um, you never know. After COVID's over, I may have a reason to take a trip to Canada because I would love to do that. And in fact, I have quite a few colleagues that I already know in uh, Ontario. So bet, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm pretty well, sure I can make that happen as a business trip. So I well, get to I would love personally. it. I would love to meet you in person once COVID is Thank behind you. us. Yeah, that would be yes. wonderful. Uh, and be, keep up be. the great work that you're doing as well. I mean, you're oh, the one you. that's inspiring people and, and pulling this all together and engaging people and training them. So I love it. Thanks. Well, you know, back to something that you said um, to bring us full circle, which was when, um, when you really focus on those things that you really enjoy and let go of those things you really don't enjoy, then you have more time. This podcast is a result of that because I had been thinking about doing a podcast for a very long time and I just didn't know how I would have the time to do it because I'm like, it'll probably be a pain in the butt and it'll take me a lot of time and I'll, I won't want to do it. So I had a million reasons why. And then my team, um, we did a reorg and my mm -hmm. time got freed up a lot. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to try this podcast thing. And I can tell you, I love it. And why That's I ever amazing. thought I would, and I don't know. So thank you so much for being great part of, of this new journey. I am I honored it. to be here. And I think you, you've, this is a little gem you've got going on here. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And just so you guys all know, she does have a course for moms. Do you know the, do you have a name for your course? Do you know what? I know uh, you have a launch coming up, so I don't know if you're that far into it that you know what the name of it is. Well, the old name was not very sexy and it was just, <laughs> oh. um, was that it? Not very sexy? <laughs> no, it was how, how to launch a thriving business that fits your life for moms. And uh, it was, it's clear. I like it's clear, clear, but it's not sexy. I'll, I'll probably be yeah. renaming it before we launch again. Okay. So, all right. So here's what I'm excited about. I'm excited that we know what it is. We we've got the clear one and I can't wait to hear the sexy one. <laughs> <laughs> so no reficient, that is a memorable one. That's a sexy one, right? Yeah. Um, it, it means to be efficient with resources, hence reficient. It's so yes, it's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. So all you have to do is come up with one that good for your um, course for moms on how to launch their own businesses. Yes, I do. Relaunch. No pressure. <laughs> Relaunch. Yes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, Stephanie. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm -hmm.